I'm going to talk about some tools that I consider critical to my software development workflow. If you told me I had to go even one day without one of these tools, I would be extremely unhappy. <laughs> and the crazy thing is, just about a year and a half ago, I wasn't using any of these tools, which is hard for me to believe. Let's jump right into it. First up is Amethyst, and Amethyst is what's called a tiling window manager. It is for macOS only, but there are equivalents to Amethyst in the Linux and I'm sure the Windows space. On Linux, the most popular tiling window managers are i3 and xmonad, I think. There are a ton to choose from, but I think those are the most popular. I haven't used them, and I think there are more on macOS as well, but Amethyst does everything that I need. What a tiling window manager does is it maintains a specific layout of windows on your screen as you're opening and closing windows. So right now I have it set to full screen, basically full screen, make sure only one window is on your screen at a time. And I can cycle through my open programs using command alt and J and K. If you're familiar with Vim key bindings, that's gonna be pretty natural to you. But I, I can also switch to the other layouts that Amethyst offers. And one of which is three column middle, which is one of my favorites, especially on widescreen monitors. I have one main window in the middle of my screen and I can resize it by holding down shift and alt and pressing L and H. My side windows shrink and expand to accommodate that main window. I can easily switch to different windows by pressing shift Alt and J and K and whichever window I have selected, I can just do shift alt enter and that will become my main window. So this is really good for scenarios where you have maybe your code in the main window and you're researching how to use a specific framework. So you have your browser on the side. The three column middle layout looks a little cramped on a 16 by nine monitor, but on like a double QHD monitor, it's absolutely perfect. Some better layouts on a 16 by nine monitor like this are two pane. It makes sure that I only have two windows open at any given time. I still do have that concept of main window and kind of secondary windows. So the other thing to note is that this, these margins between the windows, that's configurable. I have that set to hundred pixels just for aesthetic purposes for the video. And as I'm working, I typically don't have that set to more than a few pixels. You can definitely maximize your screen space by setting that to zero pixels if you want to. There are some other interesting layouts. There's tall, so you have one window that takes up the entire height of the screen. There's a, a row for each of your other windows on the other side of the screen. That's kind of nice. So I could see using this on a 16 by nine monitor where I have like my code in this this main window, the main pane on the, on the left. And then I have like a design document on the upper right and then a browser on the lower right for doing research. That's a layout I can see a lot of people using. Next up is Doom Emacs. And if you watched any of my videos in the past year or so, you probably know I'm a big fan of Doom Emacs. Emacs is pretty much the oldest open source project that's still under active development. It's a very popular text editor. Some people claim it's an operating system. That debate is outside the scope of this video. What I do know is I love Emacs for writing code and taking notes and pretty much doing any sort of text editing that I need to do. Doom Emacs is what's called a configuration framework for Emacs. Emacs is actually notoriously difficult to configure when you're first starting out. The veterans will say, oh no, it's not that hard. But when, when you're first starting out, you kind of want to see what something's capable of before you invest a lot of time in it. And these configuration frameworks for Emacs and Vim, which I'll get to later, are perfect for doing that. If you're starting out with vanilla Emacs with no configuration framework, you'd have to kind of go and figure out which plugins do what. Doom Emacs is nice because it has all the ones that you're probably going to want pre-installed. And it has a file called init.el where you can basically uncomment all the languages, all the programming languages and features that you plan to use. And the framework will automatically enable and disable the necessary plugins based on what you're planning to do. So basically, for example, uh, you can see in line 18 or in line 99, I have maggot. Maggot is a Git client, despite the somewhat awful name. It's a very popular Git client for Emacs. So I have that uncommented. I also have, of course, Rust. This line this line is commented out by default. So all I need to do to enable Rust development in Emacs is uncomment this line, and I'm pretty much good to go, as long as I have the language server installed, Rust Analyzer. Same thing with Python, Markdown, even like lesser known languages like Nim are in here. And all you have to do is uncomment them. My other favorite feature about Emacs that I've talked about before a little bit is Org Roam. Org Roam is a fantastic tool for taking notes and making links between your notes. I now use this when I'm learning a framework. So for example, I recently learned how to use the Leptos framework for Rust. Uh, I can do space NRF and search for a specific org roam document, type in leptos and boom, I'm there. And in this document, I can have links to other documents. If you're not familiar with org mode, org mode is, is a format sort of like Markdown, but more powerful. And you can see I have inline code snippets here. There's a way to run your code snippets in line in your org document if you want to. This is not a complete code snippet, so I can't do it here, but that's something you can do if you want to. So I can have my notes here and I can pop open a, another pane. 
and open open a project. So I can be working on my code here and I have my notes on this other side. This is a setup that I use quite often when I'm coding. Next up is Tmux, and Tmux is what's called a terminal multiplexer. Tmux, in my mind, has two main use cases, the first of which is to have many terminals within one terminal session on your machine. To start Tmux, just run Tmux, and then from here, you can do Control-B, C, and it creates a what's called a new window. I have my, my list of windows on the bottom here, so Windows 0 and Window 1. I can name these, so I can do Control-B, C, or control B comma rather, and uh, I can name it something. I can switch between my windows by doing control B and then the number that I want to switch to. And then within a window, I can create multiple panes. So if I want to do a split, I can do control B and then percent, and now I have another split in the same directory. In this way, I can do something like uh, run my web application, and in, I can have my web app running in one pane and I can be in the same directory in the other pane and, and execute file commands here. There's also a concept called sessions. If I have too many windows going on here and I wanna completely start over but maintain what's going on in this session, I can do control B colon new and now I have a whole new session and I can go back to my original session but in control B and then S and it lists all my sessions and I can kinda jump between them as necessary. So. Tmux is super handy. The other really cool thing about Tmux is if I completely exit out of iTerm, or if I'm maybe logging into this machine via SSH, and I want to resume what I was doing in my terminal sessions, the cool thing about Tmux is that it kind of detaches your terminal sessions from this open terminal window. So I can completely quit out of iTerm here. I'll quit iTerm, open it back up, make, it, make the text big again, and I can do Tmux attach and boom, I'm right back where I started. The same would be true if I logged in from a different machine over SSH. I could do Tmux attach after I SSH in, and I would get the same terminal that I had when I was working on the machine. That's super handy. Next up is something that you're probably not expecting to see in a video like this. My next tool is Day One, and Day One is a journaling app. It is not specific to software development at all. I personally find that journaling my thoughts, my discoveries, logging kind of what I did on a day is immensely helpful, both for kind of tracking progress, for identifying patterns in my learning and being able to trace the breadcrumb trail of where I came from to where I am now. Or maybe in the past, I went down a path that was fruitless. I can kind of do a retrospective on that and figure out how I went wrong. Day one is incredible for those sorts of things. I write down everything. For example, in this entry, I recorded my discovery that there is a VI mode in the Z shell, which I didn't know about. And I record all kinds of things like this because I like to trace back to, okay, when did I discover this thing? And what was its impact on my workflow after I discovered it? That's super interesting to to me. In the moment, I feel like I'm going to kind of remember everything, but I find myself going in here and discovering things that I completely forgot about all the time. I don't just journal about software development stuff in here. I journal about philosophy. I, You can see in this entry, I discovered Taoism and I watched a YouTube video on Taoism. I kind of wrote down my thoughts on it. In this entry, I discovered a, a knowledge management app called Reflect. So yeah, day one, pretty critical to my workflow, despite it not being a software development tool per se. Next up is Notion. Notion is what I use for all of my note taking and diagramming, documenting before I discover Org Roam. Anytime I have an idea for a video, I stick it in here. You can see I don't get to most of them, which is fine. This is going to be something that just keeps growing and growing indefinitely. I also have a more generic list of things I need to look into. And this is where I put all the stuff that you guys tell me about in the comments, these new programming languages that come out that are interesting. I do have an entire page dedicated to software development tools and languages. So if I look into a language, like I looked into the NIM language, at the time I'm making this video, I forgot almost everything about NIM. I can come back in here and kind of pick up where I left off. You know, tools for like Hugo for creating static, statically generated websites, the basic steps for using it. I'll, I'll record that here. I do have a section for do Emacs. A lot of people don't like Notion because they store your notes for you. I actually see that as an advantage. I personally don't want to have to deal with handling backups and managing where my notes are stored. I want someone else to take care of that for me. You wouldn't be able to use Notion if you're working at a company and you're dealing with confidential data. Notion would be out of the question for you. So, But I find for generic things that are not really sensitive, even if you're working at a company and you're taking notes on a framework or technology, Notion might still be useful there. But if you do need to maintain your own notes and own them locally on your, on your machine, Org Rome would be better for that. The other thing Notion has that Org Rome doesn't is 
good mobile support. Their mobile app is really good. It's pretty much identical to the experience on a desktop. So that's another advantage of Notion. I can pull this stuff up on my mobile phone anytime. Next up is ChatGPT. And this is not exactly an unknown tool. I'm pretty sure pretty much everyone's aware of this. I do think it might be a little bit underutilized in the software development space. I think a lot of people have a tendency to think that they don't need it. And although they're right, I think for most people, it can really speed up your workflow. It's not only there to ask about things that you don't know how to do. It also does a really good job at speeding up things that you do know how to do. In this example, I actually use ChatGPT to write a program that will help me benchmark the performance of various EC2 instance types in, in doing inference with large language models. So it's not something I'm incapable of doing on my own, but it would have taken me a solid amount of time to come up with this on my own. And this just kind of jumpstarts the process. I don't use Copilot, GitHub Copilot. A lot of people do, a lot of people swear by it. I'm not opposed to using it. Maybe I'm leaving productivity on the table here, but I prefer not to have the inline code suggestions in my IDE. Sometimes I'll have ChatGPT write code for me or and I'll ask it questions. Unless I have a question about something that happened in the past two years after ChatGPT's knowledge cutoff, I'm pretty much not Googling anything these days. I am going straight to ChatGPT as my default for knowledge discovery. If you have a specific question, you might otherwise have to kind of go through two or three different web pages to grok the answer. This just saves a ton of time. It'll give you the answer right off the bat. I do pay for a ChatGPT Plus, which gives you the GPT-4 model, which is noticeably better than 3.5. 3.5 is pretty good, but I think for $20 a month, it is an absolute steal. This monthly bill is by far the monthly bill that I am happiest to pay. Next up is the Glove 80 keyboard. And I have talked about the Glove 80 keyboard in a little more depth in a previous video. It is, in my opinion, the best keyboard ever made that I have used. It is ortholinear column stagger with key wells and six keys per thumb. It is a somewhat expensive board, but the thumb keys alone are worth the cost of admission. I, on the lower thumb keys, I have things like enter, space, backspace. On the upper thumb keys, I actually have parentheses, curly braces, and brackets. So for coding, it's absolutely incredible to be able to type those symbols without pressing any modifier keys. I have my numbers on the home row. I could say a ton more things about the Glove 80, but that's kind of outside the scope of this video. All I'll say for now is that I never want to use it different keyboard. By the way, this is not sponsored. I really just love this keyboard. And then sort of related to that is ZMK. And ZMK happens to be the firmware that the Glove 80 uses. ZMK allows for full customization of your keyboard behavior and layout. One of my favorite behaviors that I, I use that most people don't is called Home Row Mods. And Home Row Mods allow you to use your Home Row keys. It allows you to make them double as modifier keys. So for example, my F key and my J key are also the shift keys if I hold them down. If I tap them, they're F and J. If I hold them, they act as shift. That takes a lot of the load off my my pinky keys and it, it negates the need to make these like weird hand contortions to press your modifier keys. So, and then I take my modifier, I take the keys that would be in the place of the traditional modifier keys like shift and I assign characters to those keys. Like the key that would be my left shift key is actually the minus key. And the key that would be my right shift key is actually an underscore key, which is having underscores a key that you can press without pressing a modifier is amazing. ZMK, ZMK allows you to configure your keyboard, your layout and behavior with basically C code. I thought this was way too much overhead when I first found out about it and something I would never have time for. I have found that it was absolutely well worth it. If you are interested in using my layout and you don't want to look at customizing your own layout and you just want to trust what I did, I don't know if I'd recommend doing that, but if you do want to do that, uh, my, my key map and my configuration will be in a GitHub repo that I'll post a link to down in the description. So check that out if you're interested. Now I'm going to talk about some tools that I don't use as part of my daily, daily workflow, but are ones that I'm considering and or that I'm keeping an eye on. The first one is called Obsidian. Obsidian would kind of take the place of something like Notion or, or Rome, and it is growing a lot in popularity. A lot of people use this thing and it is very good. It allows you to take notes and those notes are just markdown files on your local machine. So there's no vendor lock-in. You could potentially later use a different tool to look through your markdown notes. It has a great desktop application for all platforms. Uh, it has great mobile support and there is support for syncing your notes across devices, something that Org Rome doesn't really have a good narrative for yet. It does actually have a, a Vim mode. Theoretically, you can go keyboardless with this, I think. I don't know all the key bindings, but you can use the, the Vim key bindings you, you know and love. It does do some things that Org Rome probably will never do and Notion, I guess, may or may not do, but there's a concept of canvases and canvases allow you to make kind of a visualization of, of your various notes and make connections between them. This feature is really interesting and this is something, I don't know exactly what I would use it for, but 
I feel like it could really come in handy at times. So this is like one of the features that would potentially pull me away from Org Roam or Notion. But if you were starting out in knowledge management, I would not hesitate to recommend Obsidian. It is it is very good. It also has very good support for mermaid diagrams. So in my opinion, that makes it pretty well suited for things like design documents. So you can just generate quick diagrams with code. Uh, that's That's pretty handy. Next up is a tool called mem.ai and mem.ai has really caught my eye because it's the first tool that really fully utilizes AI in knowledge management. And I think we're going to see most knowledge management tools kind of go in this direction, but mem.ai is kind of first to the party in my opinion. So I imported basically all my notion notes in here. So all my, again, all my programming language notes and things like that. So I can ask it questions in natural language as if I'm talking to chat GPT, what is the package manager for NIM programming language. The package manager for the NIM programming language is called Nimble. And it's pulling this from my page on the NIM language. If I click on sources, it shows me this NIM page that I created and I can go to it. That's pretty incredible. The biggest thing holding me back from using this, probably instead of Notion, is, well, it doesn't really have good table support yet, which I, I sort of need. The main reason I'm not using this yet is because it doesn't have dark mode. That makes me so sad. I'm very confident they're going to implement dark mode at some point, but until then, I think a lot of people are going to hold off using this until it has dark mode. But mem.ai is a tool that I think we should all keep an eye on. Next up is the Caracorder. And the Caracorder is an alternative to a traditional keyboard. It basically has kind of these like little joysticks for each of your fingers. And you never have to lift your fingers off of these joysticks. The Caracorder aims to be able to be used like a normal keyboard, but also allow for recording or typing entire words by uh, certain key movements. I've been following the progress of a lot of people on their Discord server. It does look really interesting. A lot of people have gotten over 100 words per minute. Obviously, the learning curve for this sort of thing is going to be immense. So that's something to consider. But the CEO of Caracorder, he can type over 300 words a minute, apparently, which is pretty interesting. And the idea of not having to lift your fingers makes a lot of sense using these tactile switches that go five ways instead of having to lift your fingers off the keys. Intuitively, it does make sense. Whether it's worth the investment and the learning curve, the upfront learning curve, I'm not sure yet, but it's definitely something I'm going to be keeping an eye on. All right, that's it. Those are some tools that I deem to be extremely critical to my workflow. Let me know in the comments what you think of these tools, whether there's any that you checked out and you decided you liked, or whether there's any that I missed. I have no doubt that there's a ton of tools that I just don't know about yet that I would love. So please tell me about those in the comments. I hope you got something out of this video. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.